for those of you who have just joined us. Um, first time, possibly. Um, Conway Hall is a, a, ch a charity uh, interested, interested in essentially um, promoting and generating ethical, ethical thought and ideas. Um, Thinking on Sunday is uh, the latest version of our Sunday talks, um, where people are, instead of being invited to worship, are invited to hear some ideas, hear some facts, hear some, hear some other things, and uh, then just consider them and think about them afterwards. And uh, we're really glad to have Tom Bolton with us today. Uh, Tom Bolton, as we've been saying in the office quite a lot, Murdoch he wrote, is a writer, researcher and historian. He holds a master's degree from the University of Met of Westminster and Cambridge University. He has a PhD from the Macquarie University, Tom? Shake your head if that's pronounced. That's good. Uh, we'll unmute you in a second. Uh, he works with archives and uh, institutions internationally. Um, he, and he has holds long-term collaborations with political journalist and author Peter Osborne and the broadcaster Adam Bolton, who you will possibly all know from Sky News and other such things. He has written uh, a biography of uh, that famous or infamous, let's find out, mogul Rupert Murdoch. And uh, now he is here to speak, speak to us on uh, Murdoch, the man who owns the media. So do please welcome uh, Tom Roberts. Um, as it's Sunday, um, I thought um, we'd perhaps go to the Church of Murdoch today in our exploration of the origins of the dynasty. Um, that obviously has such an effect to this day um, on our political and indeed media world. Um, so yes, this um, we're all getting used to politicians' bookcases uh, behind them at the moment and other interviewees on Zoom calls. Uh, but this is Rupert at his desk and a very important photograph up behind him to the left there of his head. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit about who that chap is. Um, Rupert's also there in the photograph with his sons, um, Lachlan and James, on various um, photographs there. Right, well, on the 19th of July 2011, um, Keith Rupert Murdoch, Keith's, um, actually Rupert Murdoch's first name is Keith, uh, the most powerful media proprietor the world has ever known, had been called to account for the actions of his tabloid, The News of the World. Now, this is the hacking scandal. Some commentators really did get ahead of themselves, um, claiming, quote, that the twilight of the gods had come. Were we witnessing the last of the fall of the House of Murdoch? But as the committee of British MPs questioned the 80-year-old about the hard facts of the phone hacking scandal, viewers around the world saw a father with apparently shaky knowledge defer to his son James, who was sitting to his side, again and again on detail. But Rupert's resolve suddenly strengthened, however, as he defended the family business, as he stressed, a corporation that nevertheless girdled the earth with, at that point, 52,000 employees and nearly 200 newspapers. There was an exemplar, another father, a paragon who couldn't be touched by the MPs questioning that day. Rupert said this, I just want to say that I was brought up by a father who was not rich, but who was a great journalist. And he, just before he died, bought a small paper, specifically in his will, saying that he was giving me the chance to do good. But that father, Keith, Arthur Murdoch had built his career and accrued his power, as I have found out and now explore in the book, by navigating ruthlessly a network of connections and exploiting the hidden intersection of press and power. It was essentially a trajectory already set by the time of Rupert's birth in 1931 a whole generation before James Rupert Murdoch, sitting there at that committee hearing, came to his father's aid that day. The will to power was embedded in the Murdoch DNA. Now, Keith Murdoch died in 1952, when Rupert was barely 21. And right away, the obituaries started a legend 
Um, and the family have basically stoked that legend ever since as a way of um, smoothing off the rougher edges of criticism that is hurled at them. Um, Keith is presented as a, a truth teller to power during the First World War with his expose about the Gallipoli story, as we'll briefly hear. And so Keith's, uh, you know, career in these obituaries was presented in stereotype by dint of hard work and talent, a lowly reporter, became the largest, um, the head of the largest media group in Australia at that time. Um, but the legend omitted some essentials. Uh, Sir Keith owed his rise to an intimacy with politicians, as we will see. And once he was on top of another generation um, of politicians, then became beholden to him and in debt to him in Australia, and indeed further afield. Um, actually, in the wake of Keith's death, um, this is one of the more um, bizarre but curious finds when I was going through the archives back in Canberra, um, there was a note that was uh, marked not to be um, read by anybody within the author's lifetime, he was a, an official, um, but also it was stated um, that it wasn't to be um, published widely um, within the 20th century. Um, and it was by a leading Australian diplomat, um, and they wrote this. Um, it was um, termed to be used only by genuine historical students and not to be quoted otherwise. So this ambassador saw Keith's whole career as, quote, an attempt to imitate Lord Northcliffe. Now we're going to hear a lot about Lord Northcliffe in a minute, um, the British press baron, uh, founder of the Daily Mail, and a First World War propagandist. For Keith, the note continued, the journalistic art had been the art of the monopolist. He had possessed a, quote, will to be rich and developed a rich man's exhibitionism um, by surrounding himself with art while pursuing his, quote, ambition of controlling the formation of cabinets and installing favored leaders. The explanation um, for this aggrandizing manipulation and control. Um, the writer of the note felt Keith must have possessed, quote, a psychopathic strain. So he certainly had his critics back in Australia, and these really are in the, the balance of the measure against the hagiographies that have been commissioned otherwise by the family on Keith Murdoch and on the early days of Rupert Murdoch's own career coming from Keith. So let's see if we can slip to another side. Let's uh, give it a go. If you bear with me a second. Right, so the northeast coast of Scotland on the 25th of June 2016. A golf buggy lurches along fresh tarmac through the coastal dunes. On its rear facing bench seat sits this chap, an 83 year old billionaire in a sports jacket. Now the blonde up front is Jerry Hall, his wife, uh, wife number four. Um, and they're being driven by somebody else uh, with blonde locks, uh, Donald J. Trump, fellow billionaire with his own dynastic ambitions and a newly re uh, minted Republican party presidential nominee. Um, now, Rupert had, um, at the point of marrying Jerry Hall, decided not to tweet ever again on that day, um, but he had just recently, two days before that, tweeted his first effective endorsement of Trump as being the best um, shot for the Republicans to have. And so now really, at um, this point in early 2016, it was time to seal the deal of support with this publicity friendly jaunt in Scotland. Now it's a location that is close to both their hearts and key in the origins of both their families. Trump's mother, Mary, had emigrated to America from the Isle of Lewis, while the Murdochs had reluctantly left uh, Scotland's shores for Australia um, back before the turn of the century. Now the white golf um, cap Trump wore as he drove that buggy that day, and there he is with it, uh, bore the popular slogan that we've all become rather too used to. Um, but five years earlier, 
in the summer sun of London um, to the south, as the hacking scandal unfolded, uh, Rupert had sported a cap of his own. Um, a week be um, before he actually delivered his uh, stumbling testimony uh, to the committee of MPs um, and told them about his father's legacy, um, he's wearing this cap and it states Rose Harty on it. Now, Rose Harty uh, was the simple fishing village on the pretty much barren Aberdeenshire coast, um, where in 1844, Keith's grandfather, so Rupert's great-grandfather, um, James, had, you can see, uh, the Murdochs very much um, enjoy naming um, everybody pretty much after family names, had founded a free church of Scotland ministry. Um, now, he's brought up in there, um, Keith, um, Rupert's father, um, and James's son Patrick um, then went on to become free church minister of Cruden Bay, which itself is just a 20 minute drive up from that golf course of Trump's that day. Now, a call from God, supposedly, um, intervened um, and the family moved at Patrick, uh, Reverend Patrick's urging um, to Australia, um, effectively probably escaping the scourge of tuberculosis really that uh, was happening there at that point. And the Murdochs were very much a family of um, solid Presbyterian stock with a, a Calvinistic dedication, propriety, and diligence. Um, but the cap that Rupert's actually wearing there refers to another Rose Harty, not the village, um, but instead it's the crew cap from his multi-million pound yacht, um, the super yacht. Um, and, you know, world leaders had been guests on that yacht and had seen the dining room with its war-wide map of the uh, world, with America at the centre, interestingly, not how we perhaps usually see those maps. Um, you know, a yacht in the middle of nowhere, the scene of unrecorded meetings. Uh, fans of succession may see you know, a bit of influence here um, with the HBO TV series and its uh, finale this season. Um, and those yachts, they're really sort of the stateless zone of the super rich, where deals can be struck and the media and political world carved up beyond the range of telephoto lenses. And in 2008, it was to this Rose Harty, to the yacht, that the um, David Cameron, then candidate um, for the Conservative leadership, um, went, um, flown by a Murdoch family Gulfstream jet. At that time, I think it was Matthew Freud, who was married to Elizabeth Murdoch, Rupert's daughters. He had put the jet at the disposal. And Cameron was um, granted an audience um, in his, yes, as it turned out, successful effort to gain the support of the Murdoch press in the forthcoming general election. And that same um, heading toward Murdoch to actually gain his approval had happened um, before, both with Tony Blair going down to as far as Australia at that time, not just to a yacht in the Mediterranean um, to talk to Murdoch before launching their campaign. Um, but a century earlier, in 1908, Keith Arthur Murdoch had been in London. Now this is Keith, hopefully we will see. Rupert Murdoch's father, the man who he's uh, named after. Um, and he was far away from his Australian home. He, you know, pretty handsome chap, physically imposing. He's very tall, um, very um, interesting eyes, apparently, from those that uh, recall at the time. Um, so he had a heavy brow, but he also had, and you wouldn't see this from the photograph, um, a, a disability, a painful um, disability of a stammer um, that he had tried desperately to try and overcome. Um, under stress, his breaths um, would become short and his, his throat muscles contracted to the point of not actually being able to talk at all. Um, the irony, really, of somebody who would go on to um, communicate so widely. And he was only 22 when he'd actually left Australia. His ambition was high. Um, he had arrived in London, um, hoping to find um, immediate success on Fleet Street, um, as well as a cure for his um, speech um, handicap. Um, he'd later be treated by um, the same chap who um, treats the future king in the um, the film of King's Speech. Um, but he found himself in a strange and hostile city. Um, during one lonely, doubt-wracked midsummer evening, um, Keith stopped to rest on a bench in Hyde Park, and the incredibly candid 
uh, letters between Keith and his father, the Reverend, back in Australia, which are in the archives in Australia. And he describes in those letters how he was suddenly gripped by what he told his father was a religious experience. Um, but even so, he simply could not reconcile himself to devoting his whole life and career to the church, as had been his father's hope and the father before that for his own father. Um, journalism instead was a calling as much as the ministry for Keith. And Keith imbued his choice, though, with a missionary zeal to his father, telling him, quote, Tonight I fancy that my path lies clearly along journalism, where undoubtedly great work can be accomplished. Now, Keith assured his father that however his future developed, he would pray, quote, for strength throughout the years to work for Christ. So very religious family, you can see at this early point. But even so, the break had been made, the decision set. After all, as Keith pointed out, with his speech impediment, he would not be able to um, preach. Um, henceforth, Keith Murdoch um, and his descendants would find you know, other platforms and a bigger congregation, the, the biggest you can get. Um, so he also, though, told his father that there was you know, utility in taking this path. He would quote, should become a power in Australia. So the ambition is really there right from the start. He told his father, I know that you have never been keen on my profession and would have preferred a more stable walk of life, nor do you trust press work for any good end. I assure you, I would be happy and relieved to give it up, but I see the opportunities and necessities and I shall go ahead to become a power for good. If I consulted my own inclination, I would be in a much easier path than journalism, but I see enormous possibilities ahead for journalism. Pretty prophetic words there. Um, but Keith saw an even higher plan than this. He was surely, it was surely the fact of having his stammer, he said to his father, a dispensation of providence for him to, for him, for, sorry, for to him that overcometh shall be given not a crown, I don't want that, but enlarged opportunities for useful service. Now, Keith's own letters at this time, and they are quite extraordinary, uh, really do sort of reveal a sort of a bubbling cauldron of ambition, sort of clashing with inadequacy, and with this sort of Calvinistic streak of uh, denial. He's a very sort of proper uh, prim man in his conduct. Um, but also he's sort of got a real sort of Darwinian sense of um, self-improvement and he very much subscribes to this sort of evolutionary um, theories of the time and I go into that in some detail in the book because there's some unfortunately quite unsavory um, things that then happen later with eugenics societies um, but I think we'll leave that uh, for today. Um, now, Keith, he certainly saw a pretty bad time of it over the next 18 months or so, but he said he, quote, wanted a struggle because the survival of the fittest principle is good because the fittest become very fit indeed. I've sacrificed a nice, easy position, comforts, friends and hundreds of pounds by coming here, but I hope to get very fit. His life, he said, he felt had been altogether too easy to that point. But from why, you know, looking into things, his path really had been smoothed by the connections that his father, the Reverend, did have back in Australia, and smoothed to the point of actually the uh, key players, political players back in Australia. His father is friends with the then Prime Minister, who's a fellow Scot in Australia. This whole sort of network of Scots emigres, um, particularly golf players as well. This is a really quite interesting thing. Trump obviously uses the golf course for his wheeling and dealing. And certainly Keith uh, you know, took advantage of that in his early parts of his uh, career too. Um, the, the newly prosperous and influential Scots back in Australia were, were passionate about their national game um, and you know all the networking um, opportunities it really did afford them um, and golf had you know enthusiastic endurance in politics at the time as well the early 1900s um, Arthur Balfour is described 
as you know being constantly on the golf course in the press of the time um, and the sport's growing importance is also in the sort of America as well at this point um, probably most typically demonstrated by um, Standard Oil's um, main head uh, Rockefeller John D Rockefeller um, and his biographer uh, says um, that, Rock, uh, that um, Rockefeller had two consuming passions uh, in life. The first one was God, and the second one was golf. Um, and the, the golf course was a sort of a highly structured setting where they could socialize without worrying and without interruption. You know, you don't approach anyone there. And it's, it's great to do your uh, chin wagging and power, power meetings. I um, mean, for Keith as well, um, you know, it, it, it sort of was a, a more comfortable um, place um, to do his talking one-on-one -on -one rather than uh, his voice failing as it did in front of an audience. Um, and golf was certainly in the Murdoch blood. Um, Keith's father, Patrick, had renown in Melbourne as one of the golfing parsons um, playing a game um, that had you know, exploded in popularity everywhere. Um, and Keith's own prowess on the course, actually, he had turned to his direct advantage to his career because he taught um, a journalist um, golf skills in order to then be taught back um, Pittman shorthand. So the, the very roots of his journalistic craft, being able to write shorthand notes, was traded for his uh, golf skill, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting one. And he also wrote a sort of a golf gossip column as his first um, part of journalism when he was 16. Um, now, when, though Keith in 1908, he suddenly has a change in his letters back to his father in Australia, because he's suddenly then, at that point, um, exposed to sort of the political scene in London. Um, and he, he starts to formulate his own political views, and they're quite quite interesting for the time it's sort of more left-wing to begin with and then a trajectory to the right as his life goes on which is mirrored by Rupert his son um, but some of the the quotes are quite striking um, he wrote to his father it quote seems to be impossible to get efficiency with class rule I have no faith in rampant democracy in fact I have no faith in government of men by themselves. They seem to be quite incapable of the task. I don't think they are better fit now than they were 1800 years ago. In fact, they would welcome a tyrant now who would give them security and not charge them too much for it. Now, a century ago, it's um, perhaps you know, foreshadowing the rise of uh, you know, popularism that we're now unfortunately experiencing. Um, and Keith had come to this view from his own direct experience in London. He had attended a um, naval league meeting um, where, you know, there's this whole gung ho, you know, trying to build up the, the fleet of dreadnoughts, you know, in the, the run up to the hostilities of the First World War. Um, and Keith described how he had discovered how, quote, um, it is as easy to play upon the feelings and emotions of the British public as it is to whip up highly strung horses. And, you know, it's, you know whip up highly strung horses. It's, it's a quote that really sort of seems to get to the nub of quite a few things um, with how he then went on um, to exploit um, his, his media in Australia for, for political power and perhaps, you know, also his son. Um, he was increasingly at this time preoccupied with attending political meetings and gatherings and Keith, he sort of bravely told his father, he's still a practicing minister back in Australia, um, that he's actually now lost his Christian faith, seeing, quote, no evidence of soul in man. Um, but as we shall now hear, um, Keith had found a new God to model himself on. And um, it's pretty much a month after he'd written that letter describing his loss of his faith to his father, um, that he joins um, the first imperial press conference, which is meeting then in London. Now, he's just on the sidelines of this. He's not one of the big players. He's just a young man. Um, but he was, Keith was struck by its, its message of strengthening sort of um, empire ties and um, political influence 
um, through the communication in Europe. Um, and, you know, it was, was a bit of a, an interesting gathering. One of the editorials in um, a, a newspaper at the time, unfavorable to its meeting, uh, declared that it's, uh, the conference had been turned into, quote, a kind of amateur war council, largely organized by the directors of the Daily Mail. Now, dizzy with admiration, uh, Keith reveled in detailing all the impressions of what he called all the great men here. And the greatest, in his view, among them was Lord Northcliffe. Um, he never speaks, but his management can be detected in all the splendid arrangements for this conference. He seems to have a great knowledge and to be simple and direct in his purposes. That, I think, is the secret of his success. He knows what he wants and goes straight for it. So, there's a little pen portrait there of Lord Northcliffe at this point. Um, as well as um, this focus and drive, uh, Northcliffe it really was a genius of the the early press um, or in the UK you know having founded the Daily Mail he sort of saw the opportunity given um, the fact of more um, people becoming um, able to read um, and you know universal education he really sort of prospered on that with more sort of engaging uh, material and particularly focused newspapers sort of women's content and things like that um, He'd, Keith said how he had found, he had expected to find him a bounding, unscrupulous, showy man of the world, but he seems to be simple and kind. And I must say I liked his appearance. But the thing most impressive for Keith really was the reach already of Northcliffe's own media empire. Um, and that really seems to have whetted Keith's own appetite and stirred his own ambition. At this point, as he stressed, as Keith stressed to his father, um, Northcliffe owned the Times and uh, a fair few other um, many uh, London newspapers and provincial papers and the Paris Times at this point. Um, but Northcliffe had interesting views himself. Um, and one of the key quotes um, that he set store in um, was that um, he believed this, quote, I believe the independent newspaper to be one of the future forms of government. Now, this sort of taking on the mantle of helping to guide um, and inform and steer the masses is something that Keith really does embrace. Um, now, following the outbreak of war in August 1914, Keith has gone back to Australia. He's failed in his first attempts to break through um, into the whole Fleet Street world. He'd had a, an interview at which his uh, stammer had um, um, kicked in and disrupted the interview. But he'd, he'd um, basically been able to regroup in Australia and start up his career properly there again. Um, and the British government had invited Australia to send a war correspondent to uh, the uh, field of battle. Um, Keith didn't actually win out um, getting that role, um, but what he did do was manage to get a plum position in heading up a cable service, and it was the main cable service um, that would be based in London, supplying all the news um, feeds back to Australia and New Zealand. And Keith really saw that that, you know, having control of literally the news source um, was actually more powerful than being a simple correspondent stuck out in the field. But as perhaps some of you know, and you know, is, is the well-told tale within the Murdoch family mythology, Keith actually stopped on his way to Gallipoli, um, to London at Gallipoli in the Dardanelles um, and was shocked at the conditions um, and wrote a sort of a blistering coruscating letter to the prime, Australian Prime Minister, who's a personal and family friend, um, 7,000 words or so, trying to set out the conditions. And it's on that basis, this sort of exposure of the supposed misconduct of the generals, um, that a lot of Keith's reputation for being a, a truth sayer um, rests. Um, and arriving, you know, back in London, well, arriving in London with this lesson, with this information, already causing a stir in the corridors of power, um, Keith becomes a sort of a man in demand, particularly um, because Lord Northcliffe, um, who Keith's only seen from afar before, 
um, has been itching to get a reason to stop the Second Front and focus on the Western Front. Um, and he now sees in Keith um, the ability to do that. And, you know, Keith's actual office for his cable service is based at the Times building in Printing House Square. Um, and so he's wined and dined by the editor of the Times um, and then soon also by Northcliffe himself. Um, and the, the letter actually gets circulated as a cabinet paper. Um, now, the, this sort of heat of intrigue here, um, which hasn't been exposed before, is utterly fascinating. Um, Keith Murdoch, uh, in, in Rupert Murdoch's telling, was a sort of anti-establishment figure and fighting for truth. Actually, as my research has shown, as, as I detail in the book, he was at the heart of things there in Downing Street in London. Um, so much so um, that he actually has a secret engagement um, with the daughter of um, Andrew Bonar Law, who's then the Chancellor at Number 11 Downing Street, um, and would um, then turn out to be the Prime Minister for a very brief time, um, but in about 1920. Um, so it's, he's right there at the heart of power at that point. And there's, you know, cutting commentary um, from others about this. You know, who is this Australian? How come he's managed to inveigle his way in here? Um, and Keith is, you know, it's very good at being able to play these um, forces off against each other. Each other. Um, but the one he really latches on to is, is Northcliffe, because in Northcliffe he sees somebody who is perfected being able to balance political media power in a sort of way of um, exerting influence. Um, now, yeah, Northcliffe really takes him under his wing, um, you know, trips out to his country house and things. Um, and he has this workaday experience right next to Northcliffe. Um, while Keith had failed previously on his London trip um, back in 1908, 1909, now he's really in the heart of things. Um, one official, though, um, said his position was difficult to pin down. Exactly what Murdoch's position is, they did not know. Quote, he should, I presume, be a journalist, pure and simple. But I gather he is more of a private agent and interviews the Prime Minister and others. Publicising this relationship with uh, Northcliffe and also the Australian Prime Minister had given Keith, quote, an opportunity of putting in his oar undesirably. Quote, he is one of these busybodies who in his desire to have his fingers in every pie would like to have a man in London to whom he could, to a certain extent, dictate who would come to him with all news regarding the army and forces and be influenced by Murdoch's own ideas. And certainly he really does put that all in. Um, he gets an Australian journal dismissed, um, you know, f without good cause actually. And there's unfortunate um, uh, relations with the, the, the general's actually Jewish. So it's, you know, some difficult stuff we have to look at there. Um, but the, the Attorney General himself of Australia at the time concluded in a private note that Keith was, quote, obviously one of the most ambitious of the pressmen who had set themselves up to rule over us. The First World War really marks a shift in the way that the, the press really comes to power and really exerts it, um, also with propaganda operations. Um, and I tell in the book uh, the story of the corpse factory uh, scandal, um, which is an invented story about German um, uh, authorities rendering down German corpses and making um, butter, quite literally butter out of them and other things. And Keith relays all this and is in cahoots with Northcliffe in using that as a cudgel to beat the, uh, the Germans with. Um, but after the war, um, he's going to be going back to Australia. He sees that's where he can really start off his power being a bigger fish in a smaller pool. Um, but what he does, he taps up Northcliffe for all the advice he can possibly get. Um, but Northcliffe by this time has actually changed. He's sort of become, um, as others describe, you know, somebody with megalomaniac tendencies by now. There's debate and rumour as to, you know, whether he perhaps he was losing his mind. Um, he, was, he lived quite a, a colourful life um, and the you know, thought was he had syphilis and his mind was in deterioration. Um, but, you know, it, it could have been other things as well. Um, the, 
the interesting thing, there's, a, there's an account by an American uh, fellow journalist who's also there covering the war. So he and Keith are there at one of Lorthgar's country house weekend meetings. And this journalist recalls how on that Sunday afternoon gathering, um, Northcliffe had suddenly um, changed the, uh, the conversation into quite a, a cauterizing outburst aimed at Keith um, d when they were discussing the modern media. Uh, Northcliffe had told Keith with, quote, flaming words against all who soil the souls of children, declaring, quote, I see a girl or boy or young woman or man reading a diseased book or watching a diseased picture or play, and I'm a murderer at heart. Um, it's more of this kind of colourful stuff. And it was simply because Keith had actually said that, but surely you're just giving them what they want. And Keith, you know, proper man that he was, could play it both ways. Um, you know, sensation had its place if it meant um, you'd get the readers. Um, so it's, it's an interesting development of his appreciation of how you wield the power of the media, even as Northcliffe, he was actually sort of backing away from the, the worst um, excesses of it. So, yes, but um, by mid-February of 1921, let's see if we've got some pictures. That's um, Patrick Murdoch, so that's Keith's father there, and that's, so that's Rupert Murdoch's grandfather. Uh, this is Northcliffe himself. Um, some people, you know, sort of see him as one of the influences for Toad of Toad Hall. He loved his motor cars and um, planes and anything new and um, innovation. Um, and yes, Northcliffe and Keith really did bond on the golf course as well. Um, here we go. And this is Keith's brother, who was actually the champion golfer in Australia at the time. So yes, they really bonded on these. This is Keith during the war. Um, you can see he's sort of wearing his, he's in uniform, but as a, a, a correspondent, as a war correspondent. And when he goes back to um, Australia, we'll see that this picture um, here, um, you know, will, will be one that lives on. Um, so, Keith then hears that he's going back to Australia. He's been given this plum role as the editor of the Melbourne Herald, but he wants to hear everything from Northcliffe about how you actually create and invigorate a newspaper to really drive readership, what the sort of real secrets of doing that are. And Northcliffe, in his sort of scattergun way, but with these seeds of genius, tells him, and this is a little smattering here for you. Um, this is actually from when they'd gone down to the south of France to the villa for a holiday to um, share information and play golf. Um, he really focused on crime news as being one of the core things um, that, and he said to Keith that police were quote, such peculiar cattle from the top down that a paper had to quote, get well-trained crime investigators with a big sense of responsibility and the faculty of gaining confidence of high and low in the force and dispelling the suspicion of the press, effectively getting in there. And, um, you know, you could say that's a, you know, kind of a hint at, you know, really having plants within the police. Getting that, quote, first class scoop over your competitors was all. And um, although Northcliffe's sort of highly paid and well-connected Daily Mail team there on this trip were in a position to know better than any of their rivals what was going on. Uh, Nor uh, Northcliffe would stress to Keith that every day he was nervous opening up his Daily Mail, um, that there wouldn't be a scoop, that he, every day you had to have news, um, quite literally, um, it had to be news that cut through um, the usual coverage of things. He would say, quote, we must have more and more exclusives and tell the public so in the story, and tell it them again the next day, and the next day after that, too, crime exclusives are noticed by the public more than any other sort of news. They attract attention, which is the secret of newspaper success. They are the sort of dramatic news that the public always affects to criticise, but is always in the greatest hurry to read. That's a, an interesting thing I you know whether we disagree with that or not I don't you know I think it's probably on the money 
Um, and Northcliffe stressed that with this attention came the boost to circulation, um, the key lesson that Keith would absorb and that he'd actually follow and enact uh, just over nine months later when he was back in Melbourne. Northcliffe had told him, and we'll hear you know, how Keith illustrates this, watch the sales drawing a big murder mystery, especially if there is a woman in it. Um, in the sage of Fleet Street's you know, experience, this, you know, a, a, woman, uh, a murder with a woman in it, and ideally a young woman, uh, was the surefire way of capturing casual buyers stirred by the big story. Um, an editor at such a time must put his, quote, best leg forward to turn out the best possible paper above and beyond the crime story itself. So um, what Keith then also took back to Australia with him was a whole sheaf of notes, which were Lothcliffe's itemised, incredibly detailed unpickings of all his newspapers about how they covered things, um, what was good to include, what to avoid. And Keith actually went on to call them his Bible, these notes. This was sort of the manual, um, or in his term, literally my Bible, um, that he would then seek to sort of um, use when he got back to Australia. Um, it's you know, bizarre, you know, from things such as even from advertisements, um, women, um, he says, Northcliffe told him to run a page every day, you know, focus on those kind of things. Um, but the other thing that really, you know, he kept coming back to was this whole point about circulation. Circulation is everything. And you need to, to get that because from that you get the better advertisements, the better class of advertiser, which itself drives um, the, the uh, sort of prestige of your paper and the appeal of your paper. But before he went back, um, he had a send off. And there's Keith uh, with Northcliffe to his side. You can see Northcliffe's looking a little, I don't know quite what the state of his mind would be at that point. Um, but in Keith's hand, as well as the cigar, it's only Northcliffe and him with the scars, is the golf clubs that have been presented to him. It's zooming in um, because this photograph was to become a sort of talismanic photograph for Keith himself when back in Australia um, and one that he would always have as it is there um, placed above his own desk. So we can see this is the sort of um, lineage really. We've got Northcliffe and Keith, Keith and Rupert um, and on we go. Um, he, you know, is there, the really interesting thing, I'll flick back to the photograph, the power players that he's here with, the man to his left is Riddle, um, who at that point, you know, heads up the group that owns the news of the world, we've got the Telegraph, we've got to this side as we zoom out again, um, we've got Billy Hughes, the Prime Minister of Australia, who Keith acted in a quite dictatorial way to, is his press agent, although he determined policy. Uh, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Telegraph owner and editor. So the whole sort of gamut of political power and press power in London at that point in time toward um, the early 1920s um, is there. So um, when Keith gets back um, to uh, Australia, he doesn't have the immediate kind of success that he thought he would have. Um, so he basically asks in repeated letters to Northcliffe, really, what should he be doing? Um, he was trying to improve the Herald along the lines that Northcliffe had urged, um, saying that I'm trying to put in the Daily Mail formula, um, which was engaging um, people-focused news and scoops. Um, he was going to mount a beauty competition. Um, he went on to do that, although he um, bulks at its um, development when it then became a sort of a semi-nude um, photograph competition and said that's beyond the pale and they rolled it back from there. Although Rupert, um, as we know from a few decades later, would have no compuncture ab about that. Um, but the real thing that proved Northcliffe's advice for Keith that he was then to replicate and that certainly 
Rupert's um, set store in was to replicate um, was the fact of a crime story. And the irony really, I mean, the hacking scandal really blew open for the Murdochs because of the crime story with the Millie Dowler um, family um, and the hacking of the murdered schoolgirls telephone. And that's, you know, the, the point at which Rupert, you know, had to be seen to meet with the family and coming out of that meeting of apology with the family, you may recall, um, he talked of this as being the most humble day of his life at the committee, but also having met the, the parents and the sister, he said that he told them um, that he, quote, had let his father down because his father's standards were sort of higher than that um, in, in the conduct of journalism. But yes, let's head back to the 1920s and see those standards. So when uh, Keith was actually writing a letter to Northcliffe on the day um, that this crime happens, and in that letter he's saying that news, quote, has been dead. He hasn't been able to have a story to work up to really um, kick things off. But on that same day, um, there was a Melbourne schoolgirl um, who was due to deliver a parcel in an alley, just actually a couple of blocks away from the Herald offices there. Uh, she never managed to complete her task. Um, and early the next morning, she was found dead in that acid, uh, passage uh, called Gun Alley. Uh, she unfortunately had been raped and strangled and the culprit was unknown. But Keith, finally had his story and certainly the Herald's front page on the last day of 1921 broke the news of the brutal murder in the city girl of 12 strangled and left in lane um, and it was this treatment of the crime that would really give the Herald um, the desperately needed circulation boost and help you know really bed in Keith's success when his detractors back in Australia were saying he's this upstart who's just come back from London with big ideas but nothing to show for it. This would actually prove his mettle. So it's the seeds, it really is the seeds of the whole Murdoch empire to this day is through the success of the exploitation of this story. And it's not a particularly savoury one, that's what we'll hear. Um, you know, interestingly, Rupert does the same. Um, uh, later on in this, uh, um, at the point with the New York Post um, and the whole fuss with the Son of Sam um, case, which you may well know a bit about, but it's worth looking into that as well. So I explore in the book as well. Um, it's this question of sort of law and order politics driving um, public hysteria about things and really sort of poking away. Um, at the police were claiming they're doing inept inquiries when actually, you know, perhaps you know, things are a little different. Um, and Keith actually sent this first edition, um, a first, you know, copy of that newspaper with the headline back to Northcliffe um, as the, the example of, you know, this is the change. Is this working? Is this right? Um, and Northcliffe replies back saying, no, it's excellent. Um, and quotes, with some big news now, you will get all the new readers you want. Um, but the, the way that Keith handled the, the unfolding story was fascinating. He sort of saw it from all angles. Um, they had exclusive interviews with a doctor who has kind of made a study of criminology, who proposed that one or more members of an alien race, meaning foreigner, unfortunately, may be responsible. So Keith was then able to use that as the basis for his pro-Anglo-Saxon keeping Australia white campaign that was also shared by Northcliffe. Again, that links into the eugenics that we come on to in the book. Um, but the hunt for the killer, um, because it's the best kind of crime in their view, because there's a search on and the readers are eager to sort of follow all the, the tracks and trails of it, was just, you know, kind of uh, poured over uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and he uses photographs, um, they sort of mock up a photograph, even though there wasn't a recent one of how the girl would have looked. Um, they sort of do sort of scene of crime photographs with X marked in the alley, um, but with no sort of immediate leads to follow. The immigration and race agenda was really poured into the vacuum. Um, 
again stressing you know that features in connection with the crime quote uh, suggest the work of a foreigner um, revealing to its readers that detect detectives were tracing the movements of certain men of foreign nationality Chinese Germans and Italians um, now Keith also brought his readers actually into the quest for the killer themselves with headlines declaring the public was eager to help the police and publishing all these letters uh, the more sort of outlandish ones on the front page too um, some of them seem a bit dubious as to whether they really are uh, genuine letters or being knocked up by um, the sub-editors as a rather good hook for other stories um, and they also sort of really focus on putting pressure on the police um, so much so that they you know crank up this reward force the government local government there to kind of up and up and up the reward um, which obviously the, the readers then get interested in because there's a real chance now um, to, to benefit from this um, is that they then sort of start picturing the, the police officers themselves um, and then um, after a bit of a you know pressure on the police suddenly the police um, find a suspect and that poor suspect's name is a chap called Colin Ross who is a licensee of the Australian wine cafe in the arcade near to where the girl's body was actually found um, so the sorry I've skipped on that's Northcliffe there with his talisman medal um, the as soon as they get this suspect in custody, um, the Herald has the lead on it. Um, so it's those police contacts that Northcliffe had urged Keith to, to get in place, to get uh, the news before anyone else knows it. Um, and they really go big on it, full page width headlines. Um, they describe um, how, quote, a sympathetic detective tried to step in front of the suspect and waved his hand in order to stop us taking photographs and obviously trying to stop the, the potential trial being compromised if his identity is shown as it you know it now was um, but they the police didn't actually seek to stop the uh, the snappers again after that point um, but not to be thwarted, the Herald the following day published a courtroom sketch of Ross at the inquest into the death and also this recent photograph. Um, the juxtaposition of the two um, was, you know, constantly playing it out, the sort of the, the, the purity of the girl, the, the pretty straightforward black and white stuff, but it's effective as it then turned out. Um, when the trial started, um, the Herald really cranked up an even further gear, um, splitting its front page between a sort of a light-hearted account of the wild rush, as it said, of the thousands who had queued to gain the few places in the public gallery, and also publishing a full list of the jurymen, um, together with their addresses and occupations. And this mood would draw massive criticism from um, sort of the, the fellow um, legal experts and barristers there for all the pressure that it placed upon those jurors to convict Ross. Um, the perfectly planned timing that Keith was also employing here meant that he, on the day the trial starts, he also starts a fiction serial within the paper that Northcliffe has told him is another way of keeping the readers you then get who have been drawn in to pick up the paper for the first time because of the big news, you then trap them in with a serial. Um, the irony is that that serial is all about a man who was uh, wrongly convicted of something. Um, it first appeared in the Daily Mail. <sighs> so, um, Keith then writes to, Murd, um, to Northcliffe saying it was great luck getting the murder story and I doubt if I would have nearly as good a report to make on sales if some such thing had not happened along. Um, the trouble was um, Ross actually had a very solid alibi and it was backed by his family as well. His defence counsel um, took to task the witnesses for the prosecution saying they'd actually been put up by the newspapers. Um, including a barmaid, uh, Ross had actually sacked, 
and a prison cellmate mates who had um, claimed to have heard the confession and um, relayed the story to the press. Um, and they, you know, were also criticised for changing their stories after seeing the, the press accounts. Um, and his defence lawyer said, quote, the press and public um, insisting the crime must be sheeted home to someone combined with the rewards as motivating the disreputable quintet of witnesses. Um, and even before um, this lawyer's appointment, he, this lawyer had had to write to Keith uh, complaining about the hate mail he was receiving because he'd been named as representing Ross and his address published. Um, but Keith actually chose to publish that letter on the front page. I mean, you know, freedom of speech, and he's, he's putting it out loud and clear. And even, you know, when he's having to roll back, potentially, he's still sort of making hay from the, from the story. Um, the, you know, photographs continued to the jury whenever they'd go for a break for lunch and things. Um, and on the day um, that the um, verdict was actually announced, they ran out special editions of the Herald newspaper to really, really capitalise on the verdict's uh, news, which was a verdict of willful murder, surprise, surprise. Um, now, though Ross would proclaim his innocence to the very end, the Herald declared that the tragic drama had, quote, reached its sternly logical conclusion. Um, and it re reproduced this photograph of Alma with the simple headline of one word across the whole of the front page, avenged. Um, the story then even rumbled on further because Ross mounts a, an appeal against his conviction. Um, he then actually uh, does get hung. It's a horrific botched hanging. It's all really, really unfortunate. Um, the barrister um, for Ross basically becomes vocal in the fact of writing a, a, a short, quickly published book to try and sort of highlight what had been going on with the, the, the uh, machinations of Keith here, um, saying that basically Lynch law has been put into action. Um, and he warned that in the future, juries must be, um, quote, reminded of the necessity of never being stampeded by a newspaper or popular clamour into preconceived ideas of the guilt of any man. Well, um, Ross was executed, that was reported in a more sober way by the Herald. Um, but the editorial written by Keith that day um, stated that whilst he acknowledged that those opposed to capital punishment had rallied to Ross's side, as they did for every condemned criminal, however, the feeling of the general public in this case that the sentence of death had been a hateful but imperative duty was correct. So there's always an interesting tension with Keith um, in whether he says that they're just giving basically what the public wants or what the public feel already or think already. It's um, an explanation Rupert Murdoch often himself says as well, they're just simply serving um, rather than leading um, or um, you know, steering the public clamour. Um, but Keith ended that editorial of his with pretty unequivocal statements that Ross had received a fair and exhaustive trial and was rightly convicted and condemned. But um, this man, Ross, had been, you know, basically wrongly convicted. Um, 80 years later, it would take, but 80 years later, DNA tests um, confirmed that the um, evidence linking um, him was not what actually related to him at all um, and he has now actually received a posthumous pardon uh, from the state authorities there in Australia. Um, the, the, the real culprit it would appear was a, a relative of the victim herself, uh, sort of a, a sadly more prosaic um, crime. Now Keith said to um, Northcote that Northcote's letters have been a godsend during this time um, and that, quote, the circulation had rocketed by nearly 40% from the day he'd first taken the reins as editor. Um, he, he details all the numbers, and the numbers are staggering. I mean, they really do rocket up. Um, but he also acknowledges to Northcliffe uh, that rival papers had attacked him for being, quote, a yellow journalist, 
um, and that he had um, come to crude sensationalism and pandering to the morbid cravings of a section of its readers and outrage of decent journalism. Um, another publication had charged him with, quote, bringing Daily Mail journalism to Australia. Keith's reply, I wish I had, exclamation mark. That was the sort of the pinnacle of success as if he could bring that sort of Daily Mail journalism um, back. Anyway, uh, Northcliffe, um, even at the time that Keith is writing that letter, is fading badly and he, he soon dies. Um, in slightly bizarre circumstances with a cult revolver in his hand um, clutching a Bible in the other as per um, the folklore of Fleet Street. But Keith himself would now have a new moniker um, through the 1920s and 30s in Australia as Lord Southcliffe. Um, and he really embraced that. Um, but as a workaholic, he sort of put off having had that failed engagement with the daughter of the future British Prime Minister he doesn't actually get engaged and marry again, uh, or marry at all, um, until he's in his um, uh, early 40s. And at that point, uh, the bride is an 18 year old uh, girl who he's spotted in the pages of one of his society magazines as a debutante. Um, that, her name is Elizabeth Green. Um, and the interesting thing is that her father, rather than being you know, a Presbyterian, self-denying, Calvinistic type uh, church stock, is the complete opposite. Uh, so if you've got a photograph here, this was Northcliffe's uh, medallion um, from the Germans during the war, which he took great store in, um, basically citing him as the devil of the English press um, there. Um, Northcliffe, you know, faded it by this point. You can see he's looking really quite ill. Um, this is the family. This is Elizabeth um, with Rupert between Keith and Elizabeth. Um, and then we'll come on to hopefully Rupert. This, so this is Rupert Green. So Keith, uh, Rupert, as we know him, <laughs> His grandparents, uh, his grandfathers were Rupert Green and Keith Murdoch, hence Keith Rupert Murdoch. Um, but the interesting thing with this chap, Rupert Green, this is where the genes potentially come into it or not, um, that um, he was the um, renowned in Melbourne as being a chronic gambler. Um, he actually had the role of being the starter for the Melbourne Cup, so a prestigious role, but obviously tied into the horse racing. Uh, world as well as being a, a wool trade expert for that part of his fortune um, and his betting habits as you know Rupert you know has, has flown very close to the wind um, on a number of times his betting habits um, impose uh, sort of a constant strain on the family finances when uh, Elizabeth um, was growing up and she would sort of later recall that though he was quote a good father um, he was not an easy man in any way, shape or form. Um, she conceded he was short tempered and quote, rather e egotistical and quite intolerant of any of our shortcomings. Um, and with the money problem, the addiction to gambling, his rages, um, as she called them, could be vicious and cruel. Um, and Elizabeth actually recalled being told, quote, uh, by Rupert, the, the father, I'm going to cut your mother up and put her in a little black box in the garden under the gardenia. So an interesting, uh, an interesting line to uh, say to your daughter there. Um, and in, in time, Elizabeth would come to believe that her son, the Rupert Murdoch we know today, had, quote, inherited his gambling instinct um, from my father while uh, Rupert Murdoch himself um, has since stressed that his um, dreaded Grandpa Green's influence on him, um, he dreaded that, um, quote, it was one of my father's nightmares, that's one of Keith's nightmares, that I'd turn out like my grandfather, which I probably did a bit, end quote there. Anyway, those Northcliffe um, notes, they were kept very, very closely um, protected by um, Keith. He never returned them. Uh, Northcliffe had asked, they were so private and you know, 
such you know consequential documents they were never actually returned and indeed they were inherited after Keith's death uh, by uh, Rupert Murdoch himself. Um, Jeff, I don't know quite how much longer we've got. I don't want to overrun. Um, I could say a bit more, but otherwise, you know, I'm fine if you wanted me to draw things to a pause there. Oh, Scott. Thanks, Tom. Um, let me just turn my camera on. Uh, I feel we've got, I feel we've had the uh, the whole Netflix series about the background <laughs> of Rupert <laughs> Murdoch. <laughs> you know, it was amazing and fascinating and sorry to uh, cut you ever so slightly short. Um, your book's available at the moment, is that right? It is. It is out now. Um, the uh, it can be in order through Amazon, uh, all the, the usual ways. Uh, it's in Kindle form as well. Uh, Ivy Taurus and Bloomsbury as the imprints. Um, and I think I think they're doing a, a virus lockdown um, incentivized deal at the moment. So um, I'm sure I'll be very happy to to, to get the book out to anyone that, that's interested. That sounds very wise. Okay, we're going to open up the microphone for questions. If you do have a question and you're new to Zoom, um, you can either find a, a window called Q&A, type into that, or there's an option, I think, in the chat where you can put your hand up. But use the chat and the Q&A to get messages to us. We, we haven't got long for questions, but uh, for now, we are... So, firstly, you can open up your uh, Graham's microphone. Hi, Graham. Still, uh, hi there. How are you doing, Scott? I'm all right. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for Tom. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed your speech, Tom. It was fantastic. It was a lovely lecture, and um, you've really given me a fully, full, conclusive insight into um, Rupert Murdoch's history. But there was something I wanted to ask you. Um, did, did Rupert Murdoch actually um, ever come close with, with his? Um, I know he's been very close to political aides and um, people like that, very high up in society. Did he ever come close to becoming um, an MP or a, a um, actual uh, Lord? And if no, then um, what, 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 why do you think this was? Right, well, it's, it's a very good question. Real, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question, thank you, Graham. Thank you. Um, it's the point that I actually explore in the book in the fact that there's a greater ability to influence if you're not actually front and center as the political face of things. Um, I think this is what Keith Murdoch, and now Rupert is exploited to the absolute degree, um, found that if you want to have power and influence, it's far better to essentially pull the strings from behind uh, the scenes. And you have greater longevity if you do that. You um, don't need to be at the whims of the electorate you can choose who you back, you can choose who you withdraw your support from. And in doing that, they are effectively beholden to you. So those kind of policies that you would want or would seek to enact if you were actually a politician can be enacted, but through, through a proxy. Um, Rupert, as to the Lord point, um, obviously we've talked of the, the media baron, Lord Northcliffe, who very much liked his title. There's another media baron that's key in the story of Rupert that I go into in detail in the book called Lord Beaverbrook, you may have heard of, who yes, I know that. The, the Express titles. And that's where Rupert actually is, as they put it, blooded. That's where he has his first job, um, you know, when still at university. Um, but again, whilst Keith was very pleased to have the honour of a knighthood, and he became Sir Keith Murdoch. Um, in the late 40s after his um, yeah, support of uh, the, the government, which is basically installed in Australia. Um, Rupert Murdoch, part of his whole shtick is that he's anti-establishment, that he's sort of outside of this usual kind of power. So it's a sort of a populist defense really, is that, you know, I, I don't actually have any power. It's always bad people that actually control things. And I'm just, you know, fighting on behalf of the people and you know this just happens like that so if you stay from outside of the establishment um at least you know, nominally in your your titles then i think that works to rupert's advantage and certainly he, he's not he's not somebody that has deference for you know royalty or titles he, he's very much the other way that way thank you thanks tom um jenna i think jenna south is asking for some clarification here <laughs> right i'll try <laughs> Hi, Jenna, can you hear us? 
Oh, I hope. Um, wondered, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, yes, thank you. Okay, um, so the man who was wrongly accused of the yes. rape and murder, I, I believe he said he was, um, he was proved innocent, or at least, you know, not guilty, um, through DNA, sort of eight years later. And I wondered how that 80. was possible given the era. Yeah, it was 80, sorry, it's 80. I'm very oh, sorry 80. if I was not... Sorry, I was 80. wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's pretty impressive given... No, I really would have been an early one. No, it's 80 years later. I see. Okay, sorry. Thank you for your time. That's fine. Okay. Okay, next up we have uh, John. John, get ready. Okay, hello. Hello, John. Hi, John. Yeah, well, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, did Northcliffe have uh, direct financial interests in Keith Murdoch's operations uh, back in Australia? Um, and also, if you could clarify the, the letter that uh, brought Keith Murdoch into prominence, I, I didn't quite uh, catch that. And you said it's become part of the Murdoch mythology. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some kind of expose of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, if I, I mean, also, would you say that in the current uh, manifestation, are there any genuine political commitments or principles that drive the Murdoch empire? Or is it really mainly about just manipulation of power? So thank you again. Got it. Okay, thanks for those uh, you know, interesting questions. Um, I'll pick things. So Northcliffe um, and the financial interest. Yes, um, this is something that's never been uncovered before, and I go into this in the book because I, I found the paper trail um, that Northcliffe basically acts as an investor, um, a, a secret investor, in uh, Keith's attempts to actually expand out from the Melbourne Herald um, to the uh, Sydney Sun, um, and I've got uh, you know explicit mentions of Northcliffe being assured by Keith um, that if this is a success, you will have power and influence and won't that be reward enough. Um, interestingly, other backers of um, Keith um, include the mining giants, the Bailey family um, back in Australia. They were the seeds of the BNP uh, Billison group. Um, and so their mining interests, all these kind of things that kind of link into the, the greater sort of business networks and power play. And that's something I really look into because that's part and parcel of this. It's not media in isolation, it's media in tandem um, and in mutually beneficial tandem, both with effectively big business um, and the press in Australia. And then it goes out further from that. Um, I mean, Keith he sets up um, sort of an operation in, Aus in America um, called the Australian American Association, which is very politically active in the 1940s. Rupert, as a teenager and, and in his early 20s, is taken along to those meetings and he's being sort of introduced to all the big uh, business power players at that point, as well as the political ones. It's the way of this whole network um, being set in motion there. Um, so yeah, um, the Gallipoli uh, letter, um, that literally have been books, books, TV shows. I've actually, if you really want a, a good insight, if you go on my website, there was a BBC uh, Two documentary, very good documentary made um, two, three years ago for the, well, five years ago for the anniversary of Gallipoli um, that explores the importance or, you know, in, in various ways of that letter. Um, bizarrely, Rupert Murdoch does feature in that as a talking head as well as I do. So it's quite weird seeing Rupert and I intercut because we come from slightly different views on his father and his legacy. Um, but yes, that's a, a documentary called When Murdoch Went to War. And that's a good primer on the whole letter point, as well as the, my book itself. I've got to give a bit <laughs> of a plug for it. But I really sort of interrogate, you know, what you know, that whole letter was really about. Um, and then the third question you had, it's past my mind, I can't quite remember it. Sorry, John. Oh, am I still online? Can hear you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, just a general question about, do you think there are any genuine political commitments or principles behind the kind of Murdoch empire, or if it's really just about kind of manip manipulation of power and access to power? 
Right. Well, the interesting thing there, and it's something I explore because it's still an unfolding story and I had to get it as up to date as possible. Um, the general view, and it's one I'd largely subscribe to, is that there is a pragmatism that Rupert does roll with where the power is rolling, but that helps, you know, kind of nudge it along and whatever. He can certainly change on things. Um, but as to sort of political ideology and what the, you know, the core tenets and whether they're consistent, the interesting thing is you're now seeing a split um, between Rupert and Lachlan on one side and the, uh, the, the son um, and James Murdoch and the other son who was having to front up the hacking things um, because James Murdoch is very much on the side of um, trying to, to get action on climate change, yeah. um, trying to sort of, you know, keep the, the foundations of democracy in place in America. Um, and he's actually now stepped back. Nobody thought it would ever happen, but he has actually now stepped back from the, the fold um, and has gone his own way. They've all got their own inheritance yeah. already. Um, so he's able to fund that through um, the significant inheritance he's already got. But yeah, he, he certainly made a break. But the, the general tenant is, you know, corporate power um, and influence, political influence, low tax, avoid it, or you know, manage it where you can. The, the, the usual, unfortunately. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Karen, Karen, you've submitted a question. I think you've opened your microphone. Hi, I was interested in whether you've had any any response from Murdoch family since your book was published. Uh, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, my original, the, this, my book is based on literally years of research and I'd previously published elements of it um, back in Australia at that point. And both at the time of publication of that and this one, there've been some quite interesting experiences um, with uh, certain uh, blocks that were put in the way. It's actually something I do go into in this book is how in the myth building and myth protecting around Keith Murdoch particularly, and also to an extent Elizabeth Murdoch as the matriarch of the family, um, people are very, very touchy. Um, the two previous books um, that were commissioned on uh, Keith Murdoch were both um, by the commissioned by the family, their hagiographies, I, I discovered another book had actually been commissioned, but was when vetted by Rupert wasn't deemed to be laudatory enough. Um, and so that was pulped, um, uh, or at least, you know, it was never actually given a release. So you have to, you know, sort of jump through the hoops. Um, are we still online or has it gone off? Oh, sorry. It should all still be here. I've just yep. changed the screen. Uh, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, as to direct, contacts um, from them. I've had uh, various sort of things relayed back, but in a way that I think is a very, you know, I, I have to sort of you know, tip my hat off. It's a good way of dealing with things is that you just play um, a sort of a straight bat and don't actually make comment um, about um, the book at all. And that, that sort of, you know, uh, damn it with lack of publicity. The withholding of publicity, the withholding of um, press attention is a really fascinating mechanism that Keith started off and Rupert does as well. Um, it's not just you know, hammering people. It's if you're actually the one controlling what people even, you know, have on their plate, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, if they're not going to get it on their plate, it doesn't exist. It's a really, really powerful mechanism being able to control, control the media. Thank you, Tom, for speaking. That was brilliant. Um, like I said, and I meant that in a, in, a in a completely genuine and approving way that that did feel like a Netflix series on the Murdochs in their background. <laughs> um, do check out the book. Uh, as you can see on the screen, Conway Hall is a charity. We um, receive no government funding and nobody's coming to our venue at the moment. So if you haven't, do please donate to us and I'll put sent out some details in the chat as well.